I'm Vivica Strand, and I'm going to talk to you about the expanding role of JAK inhibitors across immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. So I'm a biopharmaceutical consultant and an adjunct clinical professor, the Division of Immunology and Rheumatology at Stanford. These are my disclosures. So the learning objectives include identifying the challenges with traditional DMART therapy and biologics in terms of response, resistance, and tolerability, and evaluate the role of JAK inhibitors within RA and other immune-mediated inflammatory diseases in terms of the treatment armamentarium, and leverage new and emerging JAK inhibitors for patient-centered approaches to IMID management. So you've seen this slide drawn very many times, but basically we know that we have four JAKs, JAK1, JAK2, TIC2, and JAK3, and they signal together in various pairs, and this leads to STAT phosphorylation and then transcription of cytokines. So essentially the JAK inhibitors are basically interfering with a variety of different cytokine signaling. And we can actually look at the cytokine inhibition profiles specifically for tofacitinib, baricitinib, upadacitinib, and filgotinib. So tofacitinib is in the upper left and filgotinib is in the bottom right. And what you can basically see is that there's quite a bit of similarities in what we call these spidergrams, but there are differences. So one can see there's more specificity for baricitinib, upadacitinib, and filgotinib but also that there are some compatibilities that are quite similar. What we know is that JAKs display different in vitro profiles and different IC50s, and they modulate distinct cytokine pathways to different degrees and durations over 24 hours. But despite all these differences, clinically, they behave more similarly than they do differently. They don't potently or continuously inhibit any individual cytokine signaling for 24 hours, and it's actually unclear which cell types and what signaling pathways are affected at any given time. So as I mentioned, clinically, they still appear to be similar. They share similar efficacy and safety profiles. And we'll see that as we go forward. So of course, rheumatology indications, rheumatoid arthritis, three of them are now approved in both EU and US. And we expect Filgotinib, the fourth one, to come soon. Psoriatic arthritis, we have tofacitinib approved, and we have upadacitinib with their phase three select PSA1 and PSA2 studies. They were both positive and just presented at ULAR. And then we have a filgotinib phase two trial that was positive. And then in spondyloarthropathy, we now know that tofacitinib is pursuing the indication. Upadacitinib has already had a published select axis one trial. And Phil Gottner has also had a phase two Tortuga trial. And finally, in JIA, Tofacitinib had a phase three polyarticular JIA trial that was positive and been presented and are now enrolling in a systemic JIA trial. So if we look at the equator trial for Gottner in PSA, we see the primary endpoint was essentially ACR 20, 50, and 70 at 16 weeks. And then you could also see the POSI 75 scores, nicely differentiated from placebo. And then we have minimal disease activity, which is already above 20% at 16 weeks, and complete resolution of enthesitis. And the safety profile was, as with many of the JAKs, uh, there was some pharyngitis headache, and there was one herpes in this small study. Now, if you look at the phase three trials with UPA, PSA1 was upadacitinib 30 versus 15 versus adalimumab versus placebo. And these were, again, CSDMAR and IR patients, about 50% of them taking background therapy. Primary endpoint, as you can see here, ACR 20, 50, and 70, that was at 12 weeks, statistically significant. Then we have the POSI 75 and the investigator global at 16 weeks, and they were statistically significant. And the 15 milligram adalimumab was, or I'm sorry, the 15 milligram upadacitinib was not inferior to adalimumab. The 30 milligram was actually statistically superior. If we look at the total SHARP scores, again, we see a little bit better with upa 30 than with 15. 
And then we have minimal disease activity, which are nice, nice numbers at 24 weeks, 45% with UPA 30 and 37% with 15. Complete resolution of enthesitis and dactylitis, facet fatigue looking good, pain relief looking good, hack DI looking very good, and the safety profile similar to what we expect. Interestingly, that there were actually two cases with adalimumab versus one with upadacitin of 30. If we look at PSA2, what we find is just simply the two doses of upadacitin versus placebo, very similar type of data in a more refractory population, ACR 2070, POSI 75, and investigator global HACDI, facet, minimal disease activity, 29% versus 25%. And again, complete resolution of emphysitis and dactylitis, very similar safety profile, which we'll come back to at the end. And finally, this is the phase two of Tortuga in Filgotinib, and this is axial spondyloarthritis. So we're looking at ASDAS at week 12. We see nice statistical significance. We also see major improvement in ASDAS, statistically significant, as is clinically significant improvement in ASDAS. So this is the more modern outcome measurement. In active disease at week 12, well, that's a bit more to ask than we could get statistically in such a short time frame, but very effective therapy, well tolerated in phase three underway. And now if we look at upadacitinib axis, this trial was just published in Lancet. It had been precedingly presented at ACR 9, 2019. This one used the ASAS 40, but also mated by the ASAS 20. And the SPARC MRI spine was also positive statistically. Other endpoints were positive, clinically meaningful improvements, and the safety profile also looking quite good. Smaller study, no MACEs and no VTEs. So now we move on to the dermatology indication. And my understanding from my dermatology colleagues is that they like the JAK-STAT inhibitors, but they're somewhat wary about their safety profile. So we have atopic dermatitis, and interestingly, a newer Pfizer JAK-1 inhibitor, aprocitinib, just finished all phase three trials. They're all positive, and it has breakthrough status at the FDA, so it may have a fairly rapid review when it is actually submitted. There's also ruxolitinib and a combined jack sick inhibitor from Asana. Interestingly enough, in dogs that have atopic dermatitis, they scratch so much, they usually become almost hairless. And oclocitinib has actually saved these dogs. It's been almost a miracle therapy, which is very interesting. They're also looking at actinic dermatitis, and alopecia areata, I'm going to show you some really dramatic findings. And then the topical jacks in general, there's quite a few topical formulations. And improvements have been reported in psoriatic arthritis, psoriasis, atopic derm. Improvements in vitiligo seem to be more limited to facial when done topically. And we still don't know about topically in alopecia areata. But if we look at these therapies systemically, you see some dramatic findings. So these are small case series, but look at atopic dermatitis pre in the left and post therapy on the right, and the same down below. And what we're seeing is that in the eczema area and severity score, changes from baseline are statistically significant, that they occur very quickly. They're accompanied by relief in, in pruritus and very dramatic findings. And this is the abrocitinib phase three program. And I just wanted to point out to you that the phase three compare study, which just completed, was actually against dupilumab, which is the approved IL-4, IL-13 inhibitor, which has been very popular in atopic dermatitis over the last two years since its approval. So we find that insofar as we can understand from the press release, that abrocitinib is definitely non-imperior and that there was also very rapid relief in itch severity at week two, and that both of these therapies were effective not just at week 12, but continuing through week 16, and then with rescue of the placebo patients. So we can hope that this will be a therapy that will be approved, reviewed, and approved in the near future.
And then this is a smaller phase two study with upadacitinib. Again, early responses at week two and week 16 by the easy score. And this one also has breakthrough status at, at the FDA. And then look at these dramatic findings with alopecia areata, which is something that's really difficult to treat, particularly in adolescents who are very worried about having alopecia. And here we're looking at the SALT or the severity of alopecia tool, and we're seeing results that are really quite, quite early and very dramatic, as you can already see, well tolerated. And then there's also psoriasis. Now, tofacitinib had a complete development program that was submitted, reviewed, and then rejected, essentially because the US FDA had decided the 10 milligram VID dose wasn't safe. We have data from phase two with baricitinib and roxalitinib, and there's a TIC2 inhibitor in development from BMS, which we'll come back to. Then we have also case reports with vitiligo, data with erythema multiforme, and several of these products are being looked at for graft-versus-host disease. So we come back to psoriasis. I just wanted to remind you that the tofacitinib program, although not approved, was very effective. The 10 milligram dose was shown to be not inferior to a Tanercept, and thus it would have needed that approval for that dose, and unfortunately the FDA was unwilling to grant that. But there's now a TIC2 JAK1 inhibitor, brepocitinib, that's in clinical development by Pfizer and psoriasis. And then I'll show you the baricitinib data. We know ruxolitinib is quite effective, and I'll show you that data as well. So this is the phase 2b trial in psoriasis with baricitinib. And interestingly enough, they use some very high doses, 10 and 8 milligrams, as well as the usual 2 and 4. And with the concerns that four wasn't even approved in the U.S., we're not exactly sure what's going to happen in this program. As you can see, there's nice data with the POSI 75 and the POSI 90. And one can argue about the 10 versus the 8 milligram dose, but clearly both of them are better than four, which is better than two. So we'll have to see. We also know that there are certainly more decreases in hemoglobin related to these higher doses. And this is Rakhlitnev with their topical clinical development program. Look at these dramatic pictures. But what's also interesting is there are biomarkers that correlate with clinical improvement. With clinical improvement, we see decreased markers of TH17 and dendritic cell activation. And by immunohistochemistry, we can see reduced CD3, CD11C, KI67, and keratin-16 cells and markers. Very interesting. Now, this is the BMS TIC2 inhibitor, which is oral also, but it's different from the other JAK inhibitors because instead of binding the active domain on the right, it's binding the regulatory domain or the pseudokinase domain. That makes it TIC2 specific. So unlike the other JAKs, which can actually inhibit JAK1 or 3 or 2 and 1, this one's going to be specific only for TIC2. And here's some early data from their first study in psoriasis. So they have the endpoint of the POSI 75 and the 90, and it looks quite good. And, and this was very rapid onset of response at 15 days. Safety was, was very good, except for in the higher doses, they saw some acne. So they have to figure out a little bit more about this dose response as they do trials in psoriatic arthritis, IBD, and lupus. And what about sarcoidosis? So this is a very interesting single case report in New England Journal of a patient who had chronic sarcoidosis that had never responded to therapy. And what we're seeing on the left is the pre-dose and on the right, the post-dose pictures. And this is obviously of, of the skin across the neck and back and also the shoulder. And what you can see looking down below is we're looking at the cutaneous sarcoidosis active and mortality score. And you can see that each time tofacitinib is started with the green bar, you see responses. And then when it stopped, the activity goes up again and then it responds again until finally the third time the therapy is continued and there's long-term responses. 
And here we can see histologically, again, on the left is pretreatment, on the right is post-treatment, H&E staining CD68, PSTAT1 and PSTAT3 expression all go down dramatically with treatment. Very interesting. And what about inflammatory bowel disease? Well, Crohn's disease, interestingly, tofacitinib trials did not show efficacy, but we really don't know whether it was the trial design or the outcome measures because that's always been a challenge in Crohn's disease. Upatacitinib is in phase three. Filgotinib is now in phase three. And ulcerative colitis, of course, tofacitinib was approved based on the octave development program. And essentially, the doses of 5 to 10 milligrams BID were approved based on the GI um, Digestive Disease Advisory Committee advice to the FDA. However, since the concerns about safety with BTEs, the FDA has stated that you can only use this dose in patients who have refractory ulcerative colitis and have not responded to any other available therapy. Again, development programs with upatacitinib and filgotinib are underway. So let's look at the Fitzroy program. This is induction and maintenance in Crohn's disease with filgotinib. And you can see nice responses by CDI at, at even 10 weeks, which is nice. And then also what you're seeing is the results from the inflammatory bowel disease questionnaire for quality of life showing bowel symptoms, systemic symptoms, emotional status, and social functioning, again, indicating these patients are, are feeling a great deal improved. So what about other autoimmune diseases? Well, we have the autoinflammatory interferonopathies, and I love these names, candle, savvy, and sting. There's a compassionate use protocol at the NIH with baricitinib, and I'll show you some data. And then Sappho syndrome, synovitis, acne, pustulosis, and hyperostosis, and osteitis, a retrospective case series. So these are the interferonopathies. And here are pictures of several of the kids who have these. And as you can see, the before and after picture on the right, they have now gained height. They've gained bone mineral density. They've been able to taper their steroids and they've actually gained health-related quality of life. And here's another dramatic picture showing similar types of improvements. Now, this is Sappho syndrome, and this is case reports from the Peking Union Medical College. It has the largest cohort worldwide, and these were 12 females, a retrospective series, and as you can see, almost all of them reported improvements visual analog scale for pain, hack di sed rate, BASV, BASDI, and high sensitivity CRP. Very interesting. So what about some other autoimmune disease indications? Well, we have systemic lupus. There have been several phase one trials with TOFA and some later ones with another uh, JAK inhibitor. Baricitinib has the phase two trial completed, which I'll discuss. And then we've had a phase, couple of phase two trials with filgotinib, which are going to be repeated because they were done in combination with other agents and actually didn't succeed. Primary Sjogren's is a similar where we've looked at some combinations, a SICK inhibitor or a BTK inhibitor with filgotinib. Dermatomyositis, we have case reports. Giant cell arteritis, we have phase trials underway in, with baricitinib and upatacitinib. There's an early diffuse uh, systemic sclerosis study with TOFO, which I'll show you. And then we've seen quite a few single site studies of non-infectious uveitis with baricitinib, tofacitinib, and filgotinib. So let's look at the JAHH trial with baricitinib. It was 24 weeks, 314 patients with lupus. And it was defined that the primary endpoint would be resolution of the sleet eye 2 k manifestations of arthritis or rash. Well, interestingly, the four milligram dose made that endpoint, but also made the endpoint by the standard SRI4, the systemic lupus responder index, without having to look just at arthritis or rash. 
also made it by lupus low disease activity, tender joint count, and the flare index. Two milligrams showed no efficacy, but patients were able to taper steroids. And interestingly, about 70% of the patients had an interferon high signature, and they tended to be the ones who show the best response. Now we look at the cytokine expression, and you can see very nicely that there are differences in terms of both interleukins and interferons with the higher dose. So we have some combination JAKs in development. I mentioned ritlacitinib, which is a JAK3 tech, brepacitinib, which is a TIC2 JAK1. There's a BTK inhibitor plus hepatocitinib, uh, ABV V599 in lupus. And then we have several com co combination studies with filgotinib, which didn't succeed, but will obviously be redesigned and tried again. So also early systemic sclerosis, single site in Russia, which showed some very nice responses, not just by Rodman skin score, but ultrasound measured thickness of the skin and joint and tender scores. We have refractory dermatomyositis, two series that are positive and suggest we pursue, as well as with ruxolitinib. And finally, we've got the idea of using baricitinib in COVID-19 because it targets the AT lung cell, AT2 lung cell, which may be one of the most problematic parts of the infection. And there are now also trials with tofacitinib underway in cytokine storm syndrome. So let's move on to safety. So basically we have an extensive clinical development programs in RA that have told us the safety of these agents and they're generally similar. We have to remember that the serious infections tend to be less than TB and less TB and less of those than in, with TNF inhibitors. The incidence of herpes zoster reactivation is higher with this class. There is an increased risk in Japan and Korea. Malignancies are generally similar. And interesting, despite increases in HDL and LDL, there's a less atherogenic lipid profile. The thromboembolic events and DVTs are what we're concerned about and what the FDA has mentioned to us that they consider a class effect, although we're not sure that's true. Hematologic parameters do require monitoring. We have to remember that as the CRPs go down, the cholesterol efflux capacity goes up, and that leads to a better atherogenic or less atherogenic profile. CPK increases are because the reversal of inflammation induces, uh, um, reduces the inhibition of myoblast differentiation. And the serum creatinine increases are generally idiosyncratic. So if we look across here, we now have fairly similar patient numbers in terms of patient years of exposure for TOFA versus Berry and for UPA versus Filgotinib. And what we can see is they're fairly consistent in terms of herpes zoster malignancies and lymphomas. And then we see maces tend to be much less. DVT PEs vary. We didn't see the signal with tofacitinib until we saw the phase four cardiovascular safety trial. And then the GI perforations are evident, but much less than with tocilizumab. What the EMA and the FDA are concerned about is this uh, safety study in patients with one or two or more comorbidities that are considered cardiovascular risks. We don't yet know what those comorbidities are because the trial is still underway, even though the higher dose has been discontinued. None of the adjudication has been performed. So we really don't know the details about this population. We also know that the risk of DVTs in RA patients is increased, both PEs and DVTs. So how much of this is the underlying comorbidity of the disease? And if you look according to a nice abstract at ULAR, this is a Swedish register, they actually showed that according to disease activity, the risk for VTEs went up. If you set remission at a level of essentially one or no, no risk, you can see that it increases the odds ratio by high disease activity almost twice. And then we also see the Kaplan-Meier plots for VTE risk. This is from the Truven in Medicare database from last year, looking at new uses of TOFA from 2012 to 2016 versus new users of TNF inhibitors. 
And although there was a numerically higher risk, it was statistically not significant. And I think that's very important. These are the EMA and FDA announcements, RAJAX and VTE risks because of the cardiovascular study and their analyses of the data, which as I said before, remain preliminary. So the restrictions are not to use a tofacitinib dose of 10 milligrams BID and try to avoid using it in ulcerative colitis unless there's no other option. This came also from ULAR this year, and this is looking at the WHO safety database, which they call the BIGI base, and they're looking at thromboembolic safety profile for TOFA and Berry. And so these are individual case uh, reports of suspected events. And essentially, they were looking at the reporting odds ratio, which is not really a measure of risk, but more an indication of disproportionality. And so what we see here is that you can see that there is disproportionality for DVTs, PEs, uh, in both baricitinib and Europe reports for baricitinib and tofacitinib. In the U.S., it was really only for uh, pulmonary thromboembolic events. So we really don't know how much of this is a risk or actually a pre-existing risk, warning of a pre-existing risk. And then, of course, we know that herpes zoster is also increased in RA uh, and is associated with use of glucocorticoids and DMARDs. And we see that in terms of glucocorticoids with tofacitinib and in terms of glucocorticoids with both baricitinib and upadacitinib. So then if we look across the lab data that does require monitoring, we see that there are differences in which agents may or may not cause low lymphocyte numbers or NK cell changes or neutrophil numbers or increased decreases in hemoglobin. But by and large, even though these are recommended to be monitoring, it's rare that we see clinically meaningful changes, particularly since hemoglobin is so well defended by the body. We do see that some agents tend to cause LFT elevations more than others, but all of them to some extent result in HDL, LDL, and CPK elevations that we talked about, and rare creatinine elevations. So in summary, all the JAK inhibitors studied to date are effective across a broad range of IMIDs with early onset of benefit, meaning patients know that they are working and are more likely to be adherent. In RA, baricitinib 4 milligrams of methotrexate was better than adalimumab plus methotrexate, and upadacitinib 15 plus methotrexate was better than adalimumab plus methotrexate. Tofacitinib and filgotinib were both non-inferior. In PSA, tofa plus methotrexate was non-inferior to adalimumab plus methotrexate. Upadacitinib 30 milligrams was actually statistically superior to adalimumab. And in psoriasis, tofacitinib 10 milligrams was non-inferior to etanercept. Other than that, we know that the safety profile is different, but similar across the JAKs. We have to worry about thromboembolic events, DVTs, but is it the underlying disease population or is it patients who've had previous events? Yes, we can get decreased lymphocytes, but usually not clinically relevant, nor NK cells, nor neutropenia. The hemoglobin decreases may occur with higher doses of berry and UPA, but typically are not clinically relevant. We talked about why we get the CPK elevations. The LFT elevations tend to be much less with monotherapy, and we understand the effects on LDL and HDL. And herpes zoster is elevated in incidence across the trials of all these agents, and vaccination is therefore important. So I hope I've convinced you that this is a very effective therapy, class of therapies across multiple immune-mediated diseases, and we look forward to using them across many of these new therapy, new indications of diseases. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Strand. That was an absolute whirlwind tour uh, through the <laughs> Jack inhibitors. Uh, I, I much appreciate it. I need to point out to the audience, wait, there is something. Uh, if you haven't already done so, please take a moment to answer the polling questions. 
And I want to just remind everybody this activity is supported by an independent educational grants from AbV uh, and Gilead Sciences, and we, we thank them for that. Uh, I'd like to get on to uh, some uh, questions for, from the audience. Uh, uh, the first question is, is there a, any disease where specific JAK selectivity makes a clinical difference? Short answer is I'm not aware of any. Uh, it's very interesting that there are different selectivities which we see in vitro and we can see in terms of actual enzyme assays, but in clinically we really don't see differences either across diseases in terms of efficacy or, or safety. So I don't know why that tends to be true. Okay, excellent. I think I know at least speaking from a GI and IBD perspective, when we think about the JAK inhibitors, safety is certainly one of the concerns that that comes to our mind. And it's not even, I would say it's not even our fault. It all comes from the rheumatology uh, literature that, that you showed. Um, where, because we always are learning from, from rheumatology, where right now do the jacks fall within the treatment paradigm compared to the myriad of other agents that you have available? Well, I think there's two points I wanted to make. One is that they have a very short half-life. So like your therapies and most of ours, we're looking at you know one to two week half-lives, um, even longer. And these agents, five five half-lives and they're gone. Now, it may take a little longer for the adverse event to resolve, but essentially you stop the therapy very quickly, we see improvements in adverse events. I think the other point I wanted to make about these agents is that um, we use them in rheumatology just about everywhere. They're not labeled for use as a first DMAR. They're labeled for methotrexate leflunamide failures. However, we found that with just with other new classes of therapies, these are effective in bio DMARD IR patients, patients who failed multiple therapies, including biologics, as well as being effective in early disease. And they appear to be equally effective no matter what the status of the patient's disease or how many therapies they failed. And the final thing is we, we don't have any head-to-heads so this is still preliminary data. But unlike, say, the TNFs, where if you fail one and you go to a second one, you may not have as good a response, it appears that with these jacks, you may fail one, but you can respond very, very well to a second one. There doesn't seem to be an effect of having failed one versus another. But that's still preliminary data. All right, a couple more questions on safety. How does the infection profile of the JAKs compare to the biologic DMARs in, in RA? Well, I think the, the difference is that although there's a higher incidence of herpes, and that's clear, and even though there's an elevated incidence of herpes with tocilizumab in, the, in their phase three trials, there's more with all of the JAKs. And so it's very important to, to do vaccination, particularly with Shingrix. But overall, the serious infection incidence is less. It's on the order of about three, where we think that for the TNF inhibitors, it's about four to five, higher with background methotrexate therapy than with monotherapy. So that's the biggest difference. Other than that, the maces and so on are less. The VTEs, that's an issue that's still up for resolution. Uh, I'm one of the group that really thinks it has a lot to do with the comorbidities of the underlying disease because we haven't seen it so commonly in the other indications that are being studied but we'll still have to see and as we've already been evident with tofacitinib you have to treat 20,000 patient years of disease before you start to see a signal in some cases so it's highly variable and then remember with upatacitinib in the phase two and three trials Adalimumab had as many VTEs as upatacitinib did. 
Okay, excellent. And what do you think? Do you think because the TIC2 inhibitors seem to be a bit more specific as far as what they're blocking in their cytokine profile, you th- what do you think where their safety profile will, will fall in? Do you think they'll be safer than the, the JAK inhibitors? I have no idea. I don't, I don't want to speculate. I will say that it's a little strange, though, if you take a psoriasis patient and you give them um, basically acne. So they'll have to figure that one out. But I think they have been working on whether it's a BID dosing or whether it's a dose response. And again, we won't know whether that's going to be true in psoriatic arthritis yet. So we're all waiting with bated breath to find out what the psoriatic arthritis trial shows us. All right. Excellent. Thank you again for that fantastic lecture. For those in the audience, if you haven't already, please take a moment to answer the polling questions. And again, a reminder that this activity is supported by independent educational grants from AbbVie uh, and Gilead. And again, the other thing is that I, I hope you enjoyed the day. I think there's one more uh, uh, combined uh, little lecture group talk today on uh, COVID-19 and treatment of immune-mediated inflammatory disorders. Don't Thanks. forget to download the slides. Yes, and again, all of these, if you weren't able to make it live, these will all be available uh, for your review uh, in, in the following days. And I will see you all uh, first thing in the morning tomorrow for another uh, case presentations with Dr. Marola, uh, Mittal Cohen, and myself. Thank you. Thank you.